In this wee series of podcasts, we've been looking at a brief introduction to the life and the doctrine and the impact of John Knox. And we've already seen something of his early life. I want to look in this episode, this second episode, at Knox's theology. In our third episode, we'll complete our look at his doctrine and belief. And then in the fourth episode, we'll look at what kind of a man he was. Book of the Month. Follow the link to buy your copy. During the months of July and August, we'll be looking at John Knox, Scotland's reformer. If you'd like to learn more about John Knox, and there is a lot to learn, there's plenty of resources online. And if you prefer books, a good starting point is an excellent little primer, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. It's just 100 pages, and it's packed with fast-moving information about Knox. And there's a link to buy the book on www.semper-reformata.com throughout July and August. Just follow the link in the episode notes. The book costs just £5.49. A small part of that goes to support this podcast. The Book of the Month, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. So let's look a little at the theology of John Knox. And it was largely due to the work of Knox that the Scottish Reformation didn't assume an Anglican or even a Lutheran complexion. One of Knox's forerunners, Patrick Hamilton, had been a Lutheran. And his doctrine of justification by faith was distinctly Lutheran. It was through the labours of Knox that the Scottish Reformation took a Genevan view. To be fair, Knox's theology was a milder form of Calvinism than that of the succeeding generations of Scottish Presbyterians. The future theological direction of the Kirk would be the legacy of Andrew Melville. Melville was to Knox what Bucer was to Calvin, taking their doctrine and bringing it to its logical conclusion. So what was the theology of John Knox? And how did it influence the thought of the later Covenanters? Now that's where we need to look briefly at the doctrines of grace, as set out in the Scots Confession. In 1560, a committee of learned Scottish theologians was assembled to draw up a confession of faith for the Church. The committee was comprised of six men, and strangely, all of them were called John. It included John Windrum, John Spottiswood, John Willock, John Douglas, John Rowe, and the work was overseen by John Knox. And while the confession was not solely the work of Knox, we may use it as a good indication of the basic theology of the Reformer. This committee of prominent Scottish divines took just under one week in their task, although it would be fair to say that their theological knowledge was already sharp and their preparation already complete. Nor was it the definitive expression of the Reformed faith in Scotland. Although even after the Westminster Confession was published and accepted as the subordinate standard for Scotland, the old Scots Confession would still remain alongside the new, and at times it would alternate in importance with it right up to the end of the 17th century. It's also worth noting that the Confession was not a systematic theology. Its topics do not follow in any logical order, perhaps just due to the haste employed in its writing. It is actually marked with a distinctly untechnical bias. But the foundation of the Scots Confession was the Word of God. A whole section is devoted to the authority of the Scriptures. It argued that the only canonical books 
which would be recognised would be the Old and New Testaments, in which are contained everything that a man needs to know to make him wise unto salvation. In times of controversy, argues Knox and his followers, our final recourse is to the Scriptures, for God will not do anything which is contrary to his own revealed word. Well, that, of course, brought the Confession directly into conflict with the Romanists, who believed, and still do believe, that final authority rests with the Pope and with the Church Councils. With regard to redemption and justification, the Confession has been accused of being ambiguous, even to the extent that some have alleged that it differs in its treatment of justification by faith from other Reformed Confessions. Now, if that's so, any ambiguity was removed when the Scottish Reformers signed the Second Helvetic Confession in 1566, and later when they readily accepted the Westminster Confession. In early Scottish Reformed theology, the question of faith and its evidences was very much under discussion, especially between 1560 and 1647. The early Reformers were concerned about proclaiming the facts of the Gospel, and revival fires lit up in the hearts of the listeners as the glorious message was proclaimed, and sinners applied the truth to their own lives by the aid of the Holy Spirit. However, as time went on, a more personal application of gospel truth became necessary. The question was asked, how would a member of a Presbyterian congregation know for sure that he or she had been a partaker of the forgiveness of Christ and was indeed a member of the kingdom of God? To answer this question, the reformers took two approaches. Their early answer was, to point them to Calvin's catechism, which said the right faith is a sure persuasion and steadfast knowledge of God's tender love toward us, according as he hath plainly uttered it in his gospel, that he will be both a father and a saviour unto us through the means of Jesus Christ. Much emphasis was laid on this personal assurance of salvation that it rested not upon feelings, but upon the promises of God's word. A believer had assurance when he knew that he had for himself received the provision of God in Christ for him, and accepted the Lord Jesus, the Saviour, as his own. A later answer would have been that there would be good works evidenced in the Christian life. The Reformers looked for the evidences of regeneration in the outworking of Christian faith in one who professed such faith. Those evidences would need to be such that one might reasonably conclude that the person has in fact passed from death unto life. Well, that's enough for this short episode. In our next episode, we look at Knox's understanding of the doctrine of the Church and the doctrine of the sacraments. A very important doctrine indeed, because these issues were what would bring the Church in Scotland into conflict with the Church in England, and would bring about the struggle that the Covenanters had to endure. Thanks for listening, and look for the next instalment on your podcast app. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.